Lifeline family. How are you all? Great by the grace of God. Amen. Today, once again, we are gathered to listen from Him. Before we start, let us commit this time with the word of prayer. Father, thank you, Father, for today. Truly, it's by your grace alone that we can be gathered here. Today, Father, we are here to listen from you, Father. Father, I'm just a mere vessel in your hand. I pray, Father, that I'll empty myself before you, that you will use me, Father, to speak forth your word, Father. I pray, Father, that your children who are gathered here, whether physically or online, Father, that you will speak and touch them through your word, Father. I pray, Father, for the heart that is receptive to receive your word, Father. I pray, Father, that your word will grow in us, Father. Let it bear fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, Father. Thank you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. So church, before I start, firstly, I'd like to thank God for the message that he has given to us. And I also want to thank Pastor as well as Sister Sharon for giving me the opportunity to share his word in this pulpit. Amen. So as we all know, we are still continuing on our monthly focus on rewards. And today, next week we will we'll be bringing an end to this uh, monthly focus. Time has passed so fast. By next week, after next week, we will be entering the third trimester already. So, as I was thinking about reward, what am I going to share about reward? I think, I think of physical reward first, comparing with physical reward. All of us like rewards, right? None of us here don't like rewards. All of us love rewards. And normally, rewards is something that we earn. Heavily said by uh, Brother Jeremy last week through his preaching, the difference between salvation, the difference between gifts and rewards. Gifts is something that freely given to us. Rewards is something that we earn. So, God, you know, throughout the Bible, God has promised a lot about rewards. And as we all know, Hebrews chapter 11 is the chapter that talks about the whole of faith. And it says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And it will also say that God is a great rewarder, which means it's the nature of God to reward us. Amen? And we all want to be rewarded, but not many people want to earn that reward. Just like uh, even my company, right, they have this also, this rewards thing. Every annual dinner, they will reward some employees. One of them is, if you faithfully serve this company, loyal, for five years, they will reward you a watch. So, but to stay in a company for five years, not everyone can do it. You need to persevere, you need to go through all the mess, you need to go through all the challenges in order to stay in a company for five years to earn that watch. So, similar, like when we go back to heaven, God promised us so many rewards. Even two weeks ago, Sister Sharon shared to us some of the crown that will be given to us, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the victor crown, and all these are the rewards that God has promised to us. And when we go back to heaven, we don't want to go back empty-handed. Yes, we will go to heaven, like what Sister Sharon shared about the wood, the hay, the gold, the precious stones. Yes, we will do some work and we will still enter into the kingdom of God, but the reward is when we do it out of the Spirit. And when we go back to heaven, we want to hear God say this word. We want to hear Him saying this, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. This is basically the parable that Jesus talks about about uh, the talents. 
And the one that multiplies the talents, God says, well done, good and faithful servant. But the one that does not, he said, you wicked and lazy servant. When we go back to heaven, we don't want God to rebuke us and say, you wicked and lazy servant. We want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? And today, I want to bring us into a journey of a life of a, an individual from the hall of faith, as I mentioned just now. Hebrews chapter 11 is amazing, amazing chapter. When you read through it, you can see so many Bible characters inside. And one of the Bible characters is actually Moses. Moses. And today, we're going to discover through the story of Moses, and we're going to learn about reward. How Moses actually keep his eyes on that great reward. Amen? So, to start that, let us go into Hebrew chapter 11, verse 23 to 29. It says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so would drown. So today, we're going to focus mainly on verse 24 to 27. And let us read this again in the New Living Translation. This is New King James Version. Let us read in the New Living Translation, verse 24 to 27. It says, It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasure of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. So with that, I have entitled my message as The Great Reward. The Great Reward. This is actually from this verse, verse 26. What did Moses do? How can he choose? You see, he was grown up in Egypt, but he chose to share oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasure of sin. What he thought? He thought it is better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasure of Egypt. For he was looking ahead for his great reward. So this is where the sermon title is taken from, the great reward. What did Moses do? He looked ahead to that great reward. And how did he do that? Today we're going to discover about that. Amen? But before that, before that, you know, as I was preparing this message about this great reward, I searched the keyword reward in the Bible. And I always see reward always come hand in hand with persecution, with challenges, with difficulties. To earn great rewards is not easy. It's not walking in the park. 
It's not just, okay, I did this, I did that, then I can earn that great reward. No, it requires endurance, perseverance, patience, and all this, which we will discover from the life of Moses. Amen? Now, let us see the first verse, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 to 35. It says, Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering? Terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. Sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you own was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. So it says in verse 35, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember this great reward. Yes, you might have suffered terrible suffering. You might have been publicly ridiculed, beaten, suffered along with those who are thrown in jail. But don't throw away this great reward. Don't throw away this great reward. That is far, far much better than all that you have suffered. Amen? And that's why Jesus also said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 to 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because Great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Can you see? This great reward is tied with this persecution, insult, falsely, falsely accusation, and people saying all kinds of bad things about you. So, to attain this great reward is not an easy thing. Many people couldn't pass through, couldn't get this great reward because of all these challenges. But when we go through challenges, we are going through it with Christ. Before we go through these challenges, Jesus already mentioned, He is putting us as a sheep among the wolves. Of course, we will suffer persecution. Of course, we will face insult. Of course, people will falsely accuse us. And that is something that we need to know that it will happen. So if we want to hold on to this great reward, we need to know that there will be, there will be persecution. There will be challenges. There will be difficulties. Amen? And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If we want to live a godly life in this ungodly world, we will suffer persecution. Because everyone is pushing us into one direction. We are saying, no, I'm going this direction. We become, we become pain to them. Something that is like, hey, why are you so annoying? Huh? Why you do this? Why you do that? Why are you so different from us? So we are different from them. That's why we we become a pain to them and that's why they persecute us. So this is something that we can expect from them. Amen? People of the world. And let us go back to our source text, Hebrew chapter 11, how Moses actually refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Let us read again. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter daughter. From here, we can see that he is already going against the flow. You know, he was raised up in Egypt. After three months, 
of uh, him being born. His parents actually kept him for three months. And then when they couldn't hide him anymore, they actually put him at the Nile River. And this Pharaoh's daughter saw him and took him, raised him up. This happened at the age of 40. At the age of 40, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Let us re- continue. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. If he is the son of Pharaoh's daughter, which means he is actually the next in line. His grandfather is the king because his so-called mother is Pharaoh's daughter, right? So he could have enjoyed everything in Egypt, but he chose to suffer for the sake of Christ. He chose to, to share oppression with God's people instead of being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And from here, how, from here we're going to see how he actually continued to look ahead on his great reward. Point number one, identity. Identity. When I was studying this uh, Moses' life, I feel like he had identity crisis. His life was so, I would say, complicated. Because, just to give you a summary before I show you all the verses, he lived 120 years. The Bible says that he died at the age of 120. The first 40 years, he lived in Egypt. The next 40 years, he lived in Median. The next 40 years, he lived in wilderness. So there are three phases of life for Moses. Let us read this in Acts. Okay, basically this Acts, right, chapter 7, is uh, the summary of Moses' life when Stephen, you guys know Stephen, before he was stoned to death, he was actually trying to share the gospel. And then he talks about how God delivered Israel by Moses. And this is the story, and we're going to see the life of Moses throughout these verses. Let us read. Acts chapter 7, verse 17 to 36. God delivers Israel by Moses. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. Meaning, for the first three months of Moses' life, he was staying with his parents. But, verse 21, when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. This, if you read in Exodus chapter 2, you can see that The parents, chapter 1 or chapter 2, I forgot. The parents actually put him in Nile River and then like supposedly Pharaoh's daughter was bathing and then he saw and then like, hey, this is uh, is one of the Hebrews' child. And then the baby was crying and then she took him as her own son. And Moses, pay attention to this one, it says, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and did. Now, when he was 40 years old, which means after 40 years, uh, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended 
and avenge him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day, he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. All right, the first 40 years was in Egypt, right? Now he was in Midian for another 40 years. He says, and when 40 years has passed, after 40 years in Midian, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandal off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now, come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. 40 plus 40, 80. 80 plus 40, 120. And we can see this in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died. So this verified that the journey of his life is 120 years. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. So to understand about this identity crisis, let us go through the first 40 years of his life. The first 40 years, he was in Egypt. So what happened in Egypt? We're just going to run through very fast. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. And a man of the house of Levi, which is the father of Moses, went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. Both of them are from the Levite. Amen? So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, dubbed it with aspart and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughters of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And, the, and her maiden walked along the riverside and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew woman that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him and the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. So this is basically the summary of what happened 
to Moses when he was brought up by the by Pharaoh's daughter. And when I read this, right, I saw the Kairos moment. You see, if the mother were to put Moses one hour later, maybe Pharaoh's daughter would have already finished bathing and like already gone away. But God placed him at the perfect time, at the perfect moment for him to be actually brought up in Egypt. There is a reason why God actually allows him to be raised up in that environment. Amen? And this is what happened. And the Bible says, right, verse 22, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptian and was mighty in words and deeds. Which means Moses actually learned a lot of things from the Egyptian. The culture, the way, the wisdom. And in our gospel, we know that Egypt means the world. Today, I want to relate this story of Moses to our life. We are born again child of God. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But we are still living in this world. We are still living in this world. We still learn the culture, the, the wisdom of this world. We still go to study. We still go to work. Everything. But deep, deep inside, Moses knew he wasn't part of them. So today, we are in this world, but deep, deep, deep inside, we know we are not part of this world. We are not part of everyone that we meet. We are part of God's people. That's why Moses always want to go back. Always want to go back. And when he reached the age of maturity, he actually want to associate with his people. This is the life when he was in Egypt. He learned all the wisdom. He learned the mighty words and deeds of the Egyptian. Amen? Now, let us see what happened next. After 40 years, this is what happened. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So what happened was, he wanted to visit his own people and he saw two people fighting. One Egyptian and another one, the Hebrew. And out of his passion, he actually go and killed the Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian and hid it on the sand, the Bible says. And the next day, when two Hebrews are fighting, he asked them, hey, why are you guys fighting? You guys are brethren. And then one of the men said, verse 27, but he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Just yesterday, he killed that Egyptian. So today, he go and advise these two Hebrew. Hey, don't fight. You guys are brethren. Then one of the Hebrew said, Who made you judge over us? Do you want to kill me also like how you did to the Egyptian? Then something happened. Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. After 40 years in Egypt, because of his passion and he wanted to identify with the people of God and he killed the Egyptian and he knew that the news already went very far. Even Pharaoh wanted to kill him. That is the reason why he ran away. He ran away to where? To Midian. Now, let us go to the second part of his life. There are three stages, right? Egypt, first 40 years. Now, he dwell in Midian for another 40 years. There is a reason why he stayed in Midian before he actually can deliver God's people. Let us read. In verse 15 to 22, Exodus chapter 2, when Pharaoh heard of this, heard that Moses killed the Egyptian, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill the through to the water 
their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Reu, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherd. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Reu asked his daughter. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. So from here we can see God's divine plan for his life. He ran away, right? He ran away from Egypt. He went to Midian and he he somehow met this uh, these seven daughters who came and take water and then like supposedly he go and rescue them and then like you know all the love story lah. <laughs> and it says they answered an Egyptian rescued us which means uh, which means Moses was raised up in such a way that people when people see him this is an Egyptian you know sometimes when 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 we see Singaporean, this guy is sure Singaporean one. This guy is sure Malaysian. This one is sure Indonesian. There is some sort of way that they has been brought up. We know, we can identify. So we can see that, hey, Moses, he's actually an Egyptian. They thought he was an Egyptian. But deep inside, he's actually not an Egyptian. He's a Hebrew. That's why uh, when, when he left Egypt, even when he was in Midian, when he had a son, uh, he called his son, Gershom, which means I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Which means even though he was in Egypt, even though he was in Midian, he was never at home. Because it's not his home. Amen? And let us see next. What did he become? He became a shepherd. Exodus chapter 3 verse 1 mentioned this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Why I bring up his occupation here? Because at that time, during that time, shepherd is actually a very lowly job. And the Bible even mentioned to the Egyptian, a shepherd is abomination. When do you guys remember when we shared about the bigger picture, we go through the story of Joseph, right? When they were about to go and approach him, uh, he said, hey, go and tell Pharaoh that we are shepherd. And then, let us see in, in Genesis, you under, understand better. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and say, what is your occupation? That you shall say your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptian. Which means, to the Egyptian, this job of a shepherd is something that is very lowly. Imagine Moses from a palace. He was living in a palace. Who is his mother? Who is the one that adopted him? Pharaoh's daughter, right? He was living in palace and now he's doing a job that is an abomination to his so-called people, to the Egyptian. And he needed to go through all these challenges. At first, it's just like the graph that we saw. At first, his life was up. He learned all the Egyptian way and everything. Then he went, he went down. And it is actually God's way of putting him low. Because just now we saw, right? He says, Moses was learned in all wisdom of Egyptian and was mighty in words and deeds. So meaning, he have all the knowledge, he have all the mighty words, he have all the wisdom of the Egyptian. And God is trying to say, hey, none of those are important. God wanted to teach him to lower down himself. That's why he needed to go through that. 
40 years in Midian as a humbling process. Amen? Now, after Midian, where did he go? He delivered his people. God actually appeared to him. Let us see. And when 40 years had passed, after 40 years being in Midian, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of a fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight and he drew near to observe. The voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandal off your feet, for the place you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now I will send you to Egypt. You see, we cannot deliver God's people in Egypt if we are still in Egypt. Sometimes God allows us to come out of Egypt to go back to Egypt. We cannot blend our life to their lifestyle and try to preach the gospel to them. Sometimes God allows us to go out of Egypt and send us back to Egypt. Do you understand? God draw us out as a humbling process, shape us, mold us, put us to be who He wants us to be. Now He sent us to Egypt. He sent us back to Egypt. Amen? And to Egypt, He was, you know, delivering His people and He was stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. For the next 40 years, He was actually in the wilderness bringing His people out of that land of Egypt. Remember just now when I shared to you, He was actually very learned in the wisdom and mighty work and deeds of the Egyptian. But when God appeared to him, he said this to God, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who made them deaf or mute? Who give them sight or make them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. From this, mighty Moses, who is so learned in the wisdom of Egyptian, mighty in words and deeds, when he come before God, he know he is nothing. He know that God I have went through the lowest path. He, he needed to go through that process of being in the median. If he don't go through median, right, he might have used all this wisdom of the Egyptian mighty words and deeds, everything that he learned from Egypt to deliver God's people. God knows that this man has a great plan and purpose. God knows that he wants to use this man. But God cannot use us when we are so full of the world. God can only use us when we go to the lowest path. He became the lowest in his life. He became a shepherd, which is an abomination to the Egyptian. He go to his lowest path, and when God speak to him, can you speak? No, God, I cannot speak in the past, neither can I when I meet you. So it's only when we realize and know that God I cannot do anything apart from you, God can work. If we can still do something for God, God cannot work. Because we will strive. We will try to do things by ourselves. God needed Moses to actually go through this process. Humbling process, we call it. And it's only when he go down to his lowest path, he know that he can't do anything apart from God, God can use him. God can send him back to Egypt. Amen? This is exactly how we are as well. Sometimes God allows us, God allows us to go through challenges, difficulties, and all these things so that we can rely on him. 
so that we can trust in Him. Put our confidence solely on Him. Amen? And let us see. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 25, he says, It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. So his heart is always with the Israelite. His heart is always, he is always a Hebrew. Even though he was in Egypt for 40 years, he know that he's not part of them. That's why he went and visit his brethren, remember? The Bible says he went and visit his brethren because he knew that, yes, I'm here, but I'm actually not here. I'm just here physically, but my heart is not here. I'm not part of these people. When he was in Median, he knew that he's also not part of them. His identity, he knew his identity. Our sermon is actually the great reward. How actually Moses keep his eyes on that great reward. He knew his identity. He knew that deep inside, he is the Hebrew. Today, we are living in this world. We also need to know that, yes, we are mingling around unbelievers. We are mingling around so many people who don't believe in God, ridicule God, make fun of God, but we know we are not part of them. Similarly, this is something that we can learn from the life of Moses. Amen? He always chose God's people. He chose to share oppression of God's people instead of enjoying fleeting pleasure of sin. And in uh, Exodus 2 verse 11 to 12 also it says, One day after Moses has grown up, he went out to where his own people were. Which means he went out to find his own people. His own people is the Israelite. And watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beat a Hebrew, one of his own people which means the Hebrew is his own people. He identified himself to the Hebrews. He knew his identity, even though 40 years is a long period of time. You could have been brainwashed. You could have been made to be like them. But deep inside, he knew that he is a Hebrew. Looking this way and that, that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And... That's why when he was in Midian also, when he named his son, he named him Gershom, which means I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Which means he is never at home. Our home is in heaven. We are not attached to this world. No matter what people throw at us, temptation will come. Young people, lifeliners, there will be a lot of temptation there will be a lot of challenges. There will be a lot of difficulties. Remember when I started, I said, this great reward comes with a lot of persecution, comes with a lot of difficulties and challenges. And we all will face it. When we face it, can we still fix our eyes on that great reward? Or do we like shift our attention and we want the reward of this world? I want to be acknowledged by my company. I want to find this. I want to find life partner. I want to get this job. I want to do this. What do we want? Are we focused on that great reward? It's only when we know our identity. You see, Moses, he was in Egypt 40 years. He was in Midian 40 years. But his identity doesn't change. Today, we are the children of God. God put us in this world but we are not of this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We don't follow the pattern of this world. We don't follow the way that the world is doing things. We go against the flow. In John chapter 17, verse 16, it says this. This is Jesus talking about his disciples. He said, they are not of the world, worldly, belonging to the world, just as I am not of the world. So Jesus is not of the world. We too, when we are born again, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are in this world. We are not of this world. We are not part of this world. In Amplified Version, it says, we do not belong to this world. 
we don't belong to this world. So we always need to fix our eyes and know that, hey, yes, I'm living in this world. I learned so many things. The wisdom of the Egyptian, remember? Moses also learned it. But when he went to Midian, God put him in the humbling process. He know that there is nothing about him. God used him mightily. Amen? So always remember, we are in this world and not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. We need to always fix our eyes on that. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, one of the ways that we can keep our eyes on that great reward is to know our identity. Know that, yes, I'm living here, Deep inside, I'm not part of them. Deep inside, I have a greater reward. I shouldn't lose track on that greater reward. That is exactly what Moses did. He kept his eyes on that great reward, the Bible says in Hebrew. He kept his eyes on that great reward. Amen? My second point is maturity. Maturity. First point is what? Identity. Second point, maturity. Let us see. Matthew chapter 11, verse 24 to 27. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasure of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt. Not fearing the king's anger, he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. The key word I want to share is when he grew up. In the different translation, New King James Version, it says, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And Amplified Version, it says, arose by faith, Moses, when he had grown to maturity and become great, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So, this decision that he made it's when he became of age. Which means, when he grew into the maturity, he can choose. Now you want to choose to become the son of Pharaoh's daughter or you want to choose God's people. There is always a choice in our life. We always come to a crossroad, somehow or another. At certain age, we, we come to a crossroad, do we want to choose God or we want to choose the world? Now, when he became of age, when he grown up to maturity, he had a choice. And what Moses chose is God's people. Because deep inside, he knew his identity. He knew he's not of this world. He knew deep inside he is a Hebrew. Yes, he was in Egypt, he was in Midian, but he was never part of them. Amen? Let us see our source text. Maturity, this is one of the things I want to share, maturity allows us to choose God rather than the world. God rather than the world. He chose to share oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasure of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. Maturity will help us to see which one is better, God or the world. And maturity will help us to see that the pleasure of sin is fleeting. Fleeting means temporary. We can enjoy sin only for temporary. Temporal enjoyment only. After some time, we won't enjoy doing it anymore. He knew Maturity helps him to know that the pleasure of sin is only temporal. 
is fleeting. That's why he chose to be with God's people, suffer oppression with God's people. And in Peter, it says this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So, maturity will help us to choose God's way rather than the world's way. Amen? Maturity also helps us to know that we are going against the flow and surely the world hates us. The world hates us and we got to be prepared. We got to be prepared or else we won't be able to fight this battle. We won't be able to persevere until the end. We need to know that the world will hate us. The world will hate us because they hated him first. If they hated Jesus, what more you? You are his disciple. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would have loved its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Maturity will help us understand, oh yeah. anyways, I'm not part of them. Of course they will hate me. Today, when we believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, when we believe that Jesus took all our lifetime of sin through his baptism, through the laying out of hands by John the Baptist, Jesus walked three years for us, Jesus died for us, Jesus rose again. Today, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are in this world, we are not of this world. Even though we are mingling with the people of this world, we are not part of them. When we are not part of the world, what will the world do? The world will hate us because we are not part of them. We are going against the current. We are going against their flow. We are going against their principality, their mindset, their way of thinking. Of course, they will hate us. But maturity will help us overcome this. Amen? Maturity will also let us know that to enter the kingdom of God, we will suffer a lot of tribulation. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, strengthening the soul of the disciples, exalting them to continue in faith and saying, we must through many tribulation enter the kingdom of God. As I mentioned, the great reward comes with many tribulation, many challenges, many persecution. And we got to be ready. This message is just a preparation for us to know that the days are not going to be easy. If we're going to keep this reward, if we're going to get that reward, it's not gonna, we, we're not going to get it so easily. We've got to fight. We've got to fight every day. We've got to fight. Our own thoughts can be our own enemy. We're going to fight our thoughts as well. Amen? And maturity will also help us to see that the challenges in this world are just for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When we are matured in our faith, when we know the gospel in our heart, we know our identity, we know that, hey, this world are temporal. All this affliction are just for a moment. Don't give up your faith for the sake of just a temporal, momentary like affliction. Challenges will come, persecution will come, but always remember, as we mature in faith, we will know that, hey, this is just a season of life. This is just a season that I'm going through this. This is just for a moment. It won't last forever. The devil, when we are going through challenges and difficulties, he will make us think that you're going to die. You're going to collapse. You're going to, this will happen to you. That will happen to you. He will put all kind of thought to, for us to think that we will never come out of that situation. But the truth is, we will come out of that situation because God is with us, even in our lowest moment. Amen? And all those difficulties are just for a moment. It's just a season of life. Continue to trust in God. Continue to know that God, you will come through at the end. My life is for your glory. 
I will not be forever in Egypt. I will not be forever in Midian. I will not be forever in uh, wilderness either. I will be forever with you when I keep my eyes fixed on you. The great reward. Amen? And the great, the maturity will also help us to discern, to discern who is the right and the wrong um, person to believe in. It says this, many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourself that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. You see, at the end of everything that we go through, right, all the work that we have done, we don't want to lose this full reward. There will be a lot of deceivers. There will be a lot of people telling you, hey, are you sure this gospel is a true gospel? Look at that church, 10,000 members. Look at your church, 70 people. Are you sure? There will be a lot of deceivers coming and tempt you, coming and tell you all sorts of things. It's only when we mature in faith, we can fight against them. And we can keep our eyes fixed on that great rewards. Amen? Talking about maturity. Maturity is a good thing, but it is also a double-edged sword. Sometimes, as we mature in faith, we can be prideful. We can think that I know it all. And I'm better than you. I know more scripture than you. You know, I would say Moses is a very matured guy. I would say he's a very matured guy. But yet, uh, the Bible says uh, he's the most meekest guy. Maturity will cause you to be humble. Maturity will not cause you to be prideful. Because maturity will teach you that you are nothing. Apart from God, you are nothing. You're just a piece of dust. You are nothing in the sight of God. That's why when Moses appeared, when, when, when the angel appeared to Moses, he said, I am slow in speech. I have nothing. I cannot speak. God will say, who make one's mouth? God is the one that speaks in and through us. So, as we mature in faith, yes, maturity is important, but as we mature in faith, please remember, our humble beginning. Before we knew the gospel, we were a nobody. God picked us from the dust. God picked us, nobody like us. And He made us to be somebody in Christ. When we mature in faith, don't forget our humble beginning. Always go back and know that, God, you are the one that brought me this far. You are the one that helped me to know all the scripture. And when we mature in faith, truly matured and know the gospel in the spirit, we will know that we will not be prideful because we know that everything comes from Him. All glory, all go back to Him. Amen? And I just want to share my last verse. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 27. Then Jesus said to His disciple, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his work. It is always a choice for us whether we want to choose the world or to choose God. And this is the wise saying of Jesus, verse 26. What profit is it to a man if he gain the whole world and loses his soul? So it's our choice. Our choice every day. We want to choose to fight this fight. It's not easy. It's going to be so difficult as the time goes by, it's going to be increasingly difficult. 
But as the children of God, we know that great reward is waiting for us. He will. God never lies. One of the one of the attribute of God is God is unchanging. When He said He will, He will. He will reward each according to His work. So let us fix our eyes on the great reward. Amen. Thank you.